I see we've got 12 attendees. Um, it's gone 12 o'clock, so uh, that, that is what the event said uh, was the start time, so we, we may as well get underway. Um, so we can get back outside and enjoy the, the fine weather. Um, hello, Kia ora. Uh, my name is Tim O'Connell. I'm part of the Casman District Council Communications team, uh, and I'll be uh, just uh, overseeing them seeing this uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's uh, presentation. Uh, this coincides with the release of some new technical information uh, regarding geological hazards uh, based around slope instability, active earthquake faults and liquefaction. Uh, now as a council we're always uh, looking to improve our understanding of our local natural hazards and sharing that information with our local communities and stakeholders such as yourself. So we've got two speakers uh, joining us today. Um, they are the ones with the know-how and the knowledge. Uh, we have Diana Worthy, who's a senior policy planner for the environmental policy team. Uh, Diana's gonna give an introduction on our geological natural hazards and how the council is using this new information. Uh, for, a bit of, for a bit of background, Diana has over 18 years planning experience working for local government in New Zealand and Scotland and leads the Natural Hazards Policy Planning Work Program. Uh, also joining us today is Glenn Stevens. Uh, he's our Senior Natural Hazards Scientist. Glenn is going to give an overview of each of the three geological hazards topics. Uh, Glenn has more than 20 years uh, of uh, working in resource management for local government in New Zealand, and a lot of this time has been uh, in the Tasman region. Uh, his work involves providing natural hazard advice and expertise across a wide range of council functions across the district. Uh, now we're keen to make this webinar as interactive as possible, so please ask all your questions through the Q&A function that is uh, indicated there on the slide, um, just in that little Q&A box. Uh, all, all up, uh, our, pres our presenters will be speaking for around about 30 minutes and this will leave heaps of time to answer your questions uh, and after a short presentation on each of the hazards uh, we're going to take a little pause and uh, get to a few of those questions so hopefully uh, they all sort of line up with the topic that we're, uh, that we're referring to. Uh, now don't worry if we don't come to your question there and then uh, as we will try and answer the rest of the questions at the end. Hopefully we, we have left enough time to do so. Uh, just a quick reminder uh, the chat function uh, we won't be referring to it, so um, just try and uh, keep your uh, questions uh, allocated to the Q&A box. That would be super. All right, well, uh, we won't muck around. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to now hand over things to Diana uh, to get things underway. Thanks, Tim, and kia ora koutou. Uh, great to see uh, people online over the sunny lunchtime to learn a bit more about our local geological natural hazards. Uh, so as Tim said, I'm a senior policy planner in the environmental policy team, so leading on the planning side of our natural hazards work program. So over the next couple of slides, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction and overview on this new information. So here in Tasman, we have diverse and complex geology, which includes limestones, granites, marbles, mudstones and ultramafic rocks. And the area is also seismically active with a number of earthquake fault lines. So while our district is largely mountainous, we have alluvial floodplains of the Waimea, Motueka, Riwaka, Takaka and Aoriri rivers, and also thin strips of coastal land. And so this geology forms the places that we live, work and play. Now, when we talk about our geological natural hazards, we're referring to slope instability, earthquakes and liquefaction. And like all natural hazards, while many may occur in isolation, more often than not, they can also occur in combination. So for example, a significant earthquake has the potential to cause liquefaction and also slope instability. Here in council, we have an ongoing work program looking at our natural hazards. And this also includes our geological natural hazards. And this information helps us to manage and reduce risk to people and property. We've got specific requirements under the Building Act and Resource Management Act. And it can be as simple as making sure that 
we don't build houses across an earthquake fault line or proposing development in an area that may be susceptible to liquefaction, that new buildings have appropriate foundations. Now within the Tasman Resource Management Plan, we've got general rules around how to manage natural hazards, but we also have some specific rules in relation to geological hazards. And this is the slope instability risk area and also the fault rupture risk area. And then within these overlays, depending on what type of development is being proposed, it may require the need for a geotechnical assessment. So Glenn will talk about that a bit more in his part of the presentation. There are a few key drivers here and why we needed to review our geological hazards information. So for example, the current plan doesn't specifically include provisions around managing liquefaction. And in, in relation to the slope instability risk areas, we know that some areas have outgrown the boundaries of the current information. Since our plan was originally developed in the mid 1990s, the methodologies around how to identify geological hazards has improved. So for example, we've got new technologies such as the use of LIDAR data and also national guidance. And this information will now be used to inform the development of our second generation resource management plan, which is known as Aoriri Ki Uta, Aoriri Ki Tai, Tasman Environment Plan. And so to do this review work, Council Commission Becker Limited. And I just want to note that Nelson City Council also has a parallel work program around geological hazards, and they've also used Becker with their technical work. So there's some great synergies there across Nelson and Tasman. So we've released all this geological hazards information on our website. And so the easiest way to find it is if you go to the homepage of Council's website, and there's a shortcut link there to a new natural hazards homepage. And so on those website pages, you'll find copies of each of the new technical reports. And so this slide here shows a screenshot of each of the cover pages. We've also got a bit of information explaining each of the hazards, the maps that are associated with those reports, and also a number of frequently asked questions. So currently nationally, there's quite a push to get this natural hazards information out into the public so the communities across New Zealand uh, can better understand their hazard risks. Um, and so certainly these new natural hazards website pages are contributing to that. And over time, we'd like to release, um, we'll create other website pages in relation to our other natural hazards uh, to publish the information that we already hold and also any future work that we may do. So in terms of how Council is using this geological natural hazards information, as I said, it's going to be used to inform the development of the Tasman Environment Plan. We've also already used it as part of preparing the draft Nelson Tasman Future Development Strategy. It's been used in resource and building consent processes and also other Council functions such as asset management and civil defence emergency management. In relation to LIMS, so that's Land Information Memorandums, Council has a legal duty to disclose any natural hazards information that we hold on file in relation to specific properties. And the information is also being used in PIMS, so that's Project Information Memorandum as part of the building consent process around specific building projects. So now I'd like to hand over to Glenn, who's going to talk about the technical information in more detail. Thank you, Diana. Um, so uh, my name's Glenn Stevens, and I'm, I'm just going to go through, I guess, those three reports just at a high level just to outline what they are and, and sort of then the key findings of them. And so if we move to the first one, that was on the slope instability hazards. So as Diana alluded to, we've got a very diverse set of geology and landforms. Um, and so as a result of that, we've got a, a range of slope, uh, I guess, instability hazards throughout our district. And so when we're talking about slope instability, 
we're just talking about where a mass of, of, of rock or, or, or soil material will move down slope under its own weight. Um, this includes a, a range of processes, just from sort of rock falls, rock topples, sort of slides and slumps, landslides, right through to sort of debris avalanches and debris flows. And so susceptibility for a slope to fail is dependent on a, lo a lot of things, but um, some of the key factors are the steepness of the land and also the characteristics of the underlying soils and geology. And so in terms of the underlying geology or the rock, it's not just about the strength of the rock, it's also about the, the presence of defects, sort of fractures and bedding uh, features that we may result in being failure, pla failure planes. Um, the, the, the chemical weathering of the rock, then it's most prominent or visible in the granites that we see in Abel Tasman National Park, where the, the surface of the, of the rock weathers and de decomposes over time and loses its strength and therefore becomes much more um, vulnerable to erosion and, and failure. So having a slope that's susceptible to failure still needs a, a, a triggering process. And so these are typically natural processes of, of extreme rainfall. So it's very intense and heavy rainfall and or earthquake shaking. Now, human activities can both increase the susceptibility of a slope or act as a trigger. And the sort of things that we're talking about there is inappropriate earthworks that might be say over steepening a slope or removing the support material from the base of a slope. So Diana alluded to this um, earlier, we've got a number of controls in the Tasman Resource Management Plan. So we've, uh, the plan there identifies uh, the slope instability risk area or the SIRA, the SIRA. So in the current uh, resource plan with the current SIRA, there's sort of four key areas, Richmond Hills, uh, the Ruby Bay Sea Cliffs, um, and there's the steeper land in behind Clifton, Pohara, Liger Bay. And there's also an area at Collingwood where it's there's some sort of old terraces there, and it's the terrace scarps that are the, the, the steeper land. So this distinct Surah, it's it, it, it's an area that's mapped, and it's it's not saying that the whole area is susceptible to slope failure. It's just that we've got a higher probability of finding slope failure within this area. And so for that reason, there's a number of rules in the Tasman Resource Management Plan that essentially require geotechnical input when um, undertaking building or certain earthworks. And so that's sort of uh, fed through through the resource consent and building consent processes. So in terms of the review that we've recently had undertaken by Becca, they looked at three of the um, existing Surrey areas, the Richmond Hills, the Clifton Pohara, Liger Bay area, and the Collingwood. And so the, the areas for review were sort of defined um, based on the existing SIRA. And then we also looked at adjacent areas where there's known potential slope instability. And an example of that is just where we know the steeper slopes continue along the valley, but the existing SIRA only targeted a, a, a portion of that. We've also extended it up to, the, um, I guess, more to topographically sensible boundaries such as ridgelines. Um, and, and another key driver is also been looking at where current or anticipated uh, development pressure is. So in a sense, we're trying to target these sewers where housing or developments are likely to occur. So the review that Becca undertook was based on the Australian Geomechanics Society guidelines. It also drew upon the GNS Science Limited guidelines for landslide susceptibility mapping. So it was a, a desktop exercising using a, a range of data sources. These include the published geological maps, um, the LIDAR derived digital elevation model that's now available across much of the district. Um, and also various reports and investigations were drawn upon. Um, so the review was completed by Becca, but we had that review that they've done peer reviewed, further peer reviewed um, by Cameron Gibson Wells, LCGW Limited. So the report and all this detail is on our website. And if you want more detail, I urge you to, to go to that website and have a look. So the next three slides are just looking at the, the outputs from the Becker review. And so what we're looking at here is, is the, the, the foothills along the Richmond Ranges. 
And then the black outline there, you can see is the existing slope instability risk area. So the, the, the red and the yellow is the additional area that Becker have mapped for us. The red being areas that are susceptible to um, slope instability. In the, I should rephrase it. So these are the areas where slope instability is more likely to be found within this area. It's not saying that the entire red area is likely to fail, but we will expect slope failure to be amongst that area. And so the yellow areas are where this potential slope failure debris runouts could also impact. And so this is again it's just the same thing. This is Clifton, Pohara, Liger Bay area, but you can see here where we've extended the, the study area much more to the southwest there than the original Surah. Um, the topography, the landform is much the same as in the Surah, um, but there's uh, anticipation of housing and also the existing housing in there. We've, we've, we've extended it. And finally, there's the Collingwood, and again, you can see it extending down to the south. So I guess Dinah later in this talk will talk about the process moving forward. So Becker have done this um, assessment for us, I've made, I guess, their recommendation of these areas that should be in the SIRA, and, and we have the plan, the Tasman Environment Plan planning process um, coming up, which we will be addressing that. Yeah, so thanks, Glenn. Um, we will uh, just take a quick break now, um, digest what's just been uh, uh, conveyed, but also uh, this is your chance to uh, ask any questions and we'll, uh, we certainly do have time to answer a few now. This one's come in. Okay, this one's just asked, uh, is there a, a recording available for this webinar? If so, where will it be? Um, I can feel that one. Uh, yes. We are recording this one here and uh, we will um, have this up in probably later on this, or early next week we'll um, have it up on our YouTube page and also uh, possibly uh, we'll have a, a link or the um, recording itself on our website but certainly uh, we will uh, let you know uh, through our channels about where it is exactly just a reminder but uh, that's where it will be for now. Uh, and uh, I believe it might uh, be updating the FAQs as well, is that correct? Just based on the information we get? Diana, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, so, I'm, yeah, we're just looking, there's a question that's popped up um, talking about the 2011 um, Pohara event um and saying that it was uh, due to a build up of debris in the streams and the hills above the village and just asking about what is council doing um in terms of protection of property in the pohara and pohara valley area um so glenn i'm just wondering if you perhaps want to talk about in terms of what happened with the rebuild of those particular houses that were affected and then i can talk generally around what we're doing this with this natural hazards information um Sure. And so, yes, in December 2011, there was quite a prolonged and heavy rainfall event. It resulted in a number of debris flows, particularly in the Liger Bay area off the, the, the granite um, geology up the back. And so, a, a debris flow is essentially it's a, a concrete, wet concrete like slurry. And so, and, and, and it can flow down and through the channels, but it's very destructive when it does that. It can carry large boulders, but it also will scour out the, the channels and all the material in the channels. And so often you'll see a, a small, relatively small area of slips triggering it. And then a lot of the material is, is just scoured out of the channels as it moves its way down the catchment. And so it's quite destructive. It just picks up everything with it. So if there's uh, forestry slash or native vegetation or scrub or pasture, it just picks that up and, 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 and carries it with it. And so that um, deposited a lot of material down on the, on the lower slopes and, and the fans. And so and, and it wasn't such as the buildup of the material in the channels. It, it was really, I guess, the rainfall um, triggering it. And so there certainly were slope you know, faders, mid-slope faders, triggering those events and then scouring out those channels. 
Um, over time, through just natural geological processes, the, the material will build back up in those channels. Um, but certainly, um, it, it's a natural process. Council has no plans to sort of go up and clear those channels out, and that. Um, uh, and so, really, it's just about um, making sure that our buildings on the fans avoid these primary flow areas and the deposition areas. Thanks, Glenn. And what I would just add is that obviously we're at a point now where we now have, I suppose, this new technical hazards information and going forward, uh, it's for council to be using it across different council functions. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's work to be done still. Absolutely. No, as always, just uh, it's always about progressing and uh, the world's a changing, uh, changing beast. Uh, second question that's come through, um, is there a plan to continue the mapping in other areas of the district, uh, for example, Mitchell or, or Mataho? Um, not immediately in terms of Murchison, but um, Marahau, um is part of the separation point granites, and so that is a separate body of work, and so there is ongoing work on the granites. Um, as, as Diana said at the beginning, I guess where we've done this work is, is, is targeted. It's not across the whole district, so we're targeting key areas of development, and the main um, I guess planning outcome is this that it requires geotech um, input when undertaking building work or some earthworks. So council has the discretion to require that geotech input um, anyway, uh, just through the Resource Management Act and the Building Act. And so for those sort of more remote parts of the district where there's little activity, we'll certainly just be relying on assessing them on a case by case basis. But the, the actual outcome will be very similar in the sense it will just be that, that requirement for geotech input um, at, at building stage or for earthworks over a certain scale. For sure. Uh, cool. Next question now we've got that's come through. Uh, are there catch basins in any of the areas susceptible to debris flows? Um, no, we don't have any catch basins in our district or specific. I think in some of the highway down towards Murchison, um, which is part of the um, Waka Kotahi, I've got some debris sort of meshes on some of the little catchments, but the, the council doesn't have any itself. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Uh, and we'll just uh, share one more question before we do move on to the next topic. Um, is there an existing flood natural hazard report? Uh, if not, will there be a parallel natural hazard study slash report? If so, when? If not, why not? Given flooding is more of a current risk. Um, th there is some flood hazard reports, our engineering section or um, asset management have been doing that in our urban areas in terms of the, the stormwater and, and flood hazard. And so there is, yeah, they should be on the website, I can't tell you exactly where, but it is part of the, the urban catchment management plans. Um, as Diana also said that in terms of uh, part of this process, this webinar and putting this information is the start of us intending to put a lot more hazard information on our public facing website. So that would include, I guess, maps of the, the flood modeling that we've had done and some of our historic floods. And so uh, I'm, I'm loath to put a specific time on it, but, but it's certainly a work in progress and I certainly hope to have that out to the public within the next 12 months. And I think it's also important to add that the current flood models that Council hold um, is being used to inform building and resource consent processes. Fantastic. Thank you. Right, we will move on to the next uh, topic. Uh, Glenn, back to you. Um, okay, so we'll just look at our active earthquake um, hazards. So to that end, we got Becca to have a look at um, what active faults are in our district. Um, and so again, this was a largely desktop exercise. And so essentially they went through the published geological information um, and, 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 and to identify the, the, the faults that are considered still active. And the reason we did that is that I guess where we've got these active faults in the district, they can be quite destructive when they rupture in an earthquake, as you can well imagine. And so Certainly you get severe ground shaking in an earthquake, but along the rupture um, surface of the fault 
trace, you can get quite significant um, deformation of the ground. So that can be just, um, I guess, one side moving up, one side moving down, or it can be one side moving sideways or a combination of, but generally it results in, in, in quite a severe impact on any buildings or anything located on that area. Um, so uh, under the, the current Tasman Resource Management Plan, we have the, the fault rupture risk area, the FRRA. So it doesn't quite make a word as concise as the SIRA, but this fault rupture risk area is just sort of a, a narrow corridor along where the fault is. And so there's a number of rules in the plan pertaining to the fault uh, for certain activities there. And so essentially uh, the outcome that these rules seek is to just ensure buildings don't straddle the fault line. So essentially you need to get a geotech to identify the fault and then you have to set your building back from the fault line. So for the Richmond Ranges that setback is only 10 metres. For the Sananid area where it's the Y rails um, Alpine fault, um, the setback's 20 metres. Now that might not sound like much um, and, 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 and might make a difference, but as I said, you get the severe shaking and so from a shaking point of view it won't matter if you're 10 meters 100 meters or a thousand meters but it's that severe ground deformation that just that 10 meters can be enough to avoid so i guess the two things activities that it's mainly targeted is, is, is buildings habitable dwelling um, buildings and also subdivision and so for subdivision it's a case of identifying the, the fault trace and then ensuring the layout of the subdivision sort of sympathetic to that um, I was just going to say the, the, all the information's on on the Becker report, which is on, on the website. So, in terms of the outcomes, they they noted there's a, a number of faults already in the um, plan. These being the, the Wymere 88, the Wairo Alpine, the White Creek, and the Lyle faults. So they're already in the plan. There's already rules, and, and Becker have recommended they remain in the plan. But they did note that there's some additional faults that we may want to include in the plan, plan these being the Whangamoa, um, the Waka Marama, and the, the Kikawa. Now those three faults are sort of quite rural and, and, and so we don't anticipate um, much building or development activity near those, but we felt it was important or useful to put them in the plan as it does, I guess, draw attention. It puts them out there in the, in the, the public conversation. And, if people are aware of these faults, then they can make better decisions around them. So just as a quick schematic of showing sort of where they are. So at the, the top left there, we've got the, the Wakamarama fault. So that's sort of running down the, the, that northwestern side of the Ariri Valley. We've got two other faults shown in there, which are not recommended to be brought forward. There's the Pikiki Runa fault, which sort of runs down the, the, the Takaka Valley. And we've also got the Ruby Bay Mutri Fault, which sort of runs up in the middle of the Mutri Depression. And so both of these faults have been considered capable faults as opposed to active. So the record of seismicity is, is a bit less frequent than, than the active faults, but they're still considered capable faults, ones that you might just want to be mindful or wary of. Um, in, in the Pikiki Runa case, it's a very prominent sort of fault scarp as you drive down the, the Takaka Valley, you'll see it on the, on the right hand side driving down. Um, whereas the, the Ruby Bay Mutri Fault doesn't have any surface expression, it's at some depth. And so the, the location of it and the, I guess how often it might rupture is, is uncertain. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that the rest of the faults in the district, which I guess these are the ones that are probably more familiar with. These are the Waimea um, Flaxmore Fault System that just runs down the, the foothill of the, the Richmond Ranges. So these ones are already in our um, Tasman Resource Management Plan, but you can just see parallel to that, the, the Whangamoa Fault just sort of running a bit further into the ranges. So again, we've we're adding this more for completeness um, rather than any direct developmental pressure and that part of the Richmond Ranges is largely either conservation or state or, or, or extensive farming. We've got the Kikawa Fault which is just a small little fault that runs from the, the Waimea sort of towards that Wairau Alpine and then the Wairau Alpine Fault sort of running down through St Arnold. Um, again most of that towards the south end conservation estate. 
in the far west there, you can just see the, the White Creek Fault. So that was the one that resulted in the Murchison earthquake. So these regional faults, even though they're mostly outside of our district, are ones that we still need to be mindful of. And there's also the, a very small part of the Lyle Fault there, but, but most of those are just outside our district. So there we are. Uh, we will now take a quick break just to uh, see if there's any question and answers. And yeah, just as, uh, as Glenn uh, just pointed out before, a lot of this information will be there available uh, online to you at, at tasman.govt.nz forward slash natural dash hazards. Um, much more can be uh, gleaned by visiting that website. And uh, while we are going through the questions, if there is one or two that you might have thought of post-webinar, um, get in touch with us at um, that email address just uh, at the bottom of the screen there, environment.plan at tasman.govt.nz. We'll, uh, we'll help you out. Okay, so there was a question. Uh, I do believe this one came at the back end of the um, slope instability, so we won't... Uh, deprive Richard of his, uh, of his question. Um, you didn't refer to details about Ruby Bay. This is uh, obviously in, in terms of slope instability. Um, are the risks still being assessed or what is the outlook for instability of the bluff at McKee? That, that, that's a good point. I was supposed to mention that and I had forgotten. Um, we, we, yeah, we're not completely forgetting about that. We just felt that we didn't need to review I guess the, that location and that the reason that that areas in the slope instability risk areas, the sea cliffs along there, the large sort of cliff face. And so with our LIDAR uh, digital elevation model, we can easily see where those cliffs are. And so whilst it wasn't part of the Becker review, certainly the, the stability of the, and how we want to manage development along those sea cliffs will be part of the Tasman Environment Plan review going forward. Fantastic. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, another question, um, just if a landowner has an active earthquake fault running through their property, uh, what's this going to mean for them? Um, well, firstly, it would be, it's, it's better that they know it's running through their property. Um, but in terms of any development or building, it just means that if, if, if they want to build close to that fault, they'll just need to get a geotech to, to locate the fault and then ensure they have that appropriate setback of 10 or 20 metres. Um, uh, subdivision is the other one so and again it doesn't prevent subdivision it's just a case of I guess configuring the, the, the layout of the subdivision to, to allow the fault to pass through and with building sites that are, are clear from it so it might be that the fault runs through a reserve or the road or a walkway rather than the building sites so it will constrain how the layout a bit or exactly where on a property you can put a building but um, apart from that, there's, there's no real constraints. For sure. And I guess um, it would be remiss of us to, uh, to not uh, mention that it's always good to be prepared. Um, and there's lots of information in that regard on the Nelson Tasman Civil Defence website, uh, just regarding how to plan for an emergency and what to do after an event. Uh, it's, it's always good to know. Knowledge is power and uh, can sometimes save your life. Uh, there is another question that's come through. Uh, if a geotech report needs to be done on a property, is Becca the company to contact? Well, you're certainly welcome to, to contact Becca, but there's a, a number of, of other geotech providers in the district and, and, and they all provide good and sound work and, and council are happy for people to use any of the, the local or even out of town geotechs. Um, I, I guess there's, they've got the Engineering New Zealand have their accreditation process. So essentially, we're after um, it just needs to be an accredited uh, geotech provider, geoprofessional. Thank you. Uh, Diana, was there anything else you wanted to add just uh, at, this, at this juncture? No, it sounds all good. Thanks. Superb. All righty. Well, uh, we're on to the third topic now. Uh, Glenn, we'll just uh, continue with that. Okay, so this third topic, we're just going to talk about seismic liquefaction. Um, we did, I guess, have um, a bit of a workshop with key industry practitioners on, 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 on this at the end of last year. And so this is just a, a quick summary of that. And so firstly, what is liquefaction? Um, and so it's, it's, it's a process that just causes the sort of soil or the earth material, the, the, the unconsolidated sands and stuff to behave like a liquid um, during an earthquake. 
So to liquid liquefy their soils need to be loose and, and consolidated. So that's sort of sands and silts. Very fine clays or, or coarser gravels tend not to liquefy. It's predominantly the sands and silts. They also need to be saturated so that below the water table or, or so the high groundwater levels. And so not, not everywhere in the district meets the, all these criteria. And the susceptible sort of landforms where we find these sort of areas is mainly around the margins of the coast, um, next to rivers and lakes, um, estuaries sort of any swamping area or reclaimed cane land. So it's, it's really where you find, get that combination of high groundwater and, and, and relatively fine unconsolidated material. I guess the third ingredient for liquefaction is the earthquake shaking. And so that's just where you get the severe shaking from an earthquake. And so the, this, this is a schematic from the um, MBs, um, guidance for, for liquefaction. And so it's just showing a range of sort of the effects of, of liquefaction. If we, we start on the left-hand side, we were representing sort of the sand volcanoes or sand boils where saturated sand or silt material gets ejected under pressure upwards onto the, to the surface. So where that ejected materials come from can cause a void, can then collapse and sort of got to, I'm sure you've all seen pictures from the Christchurch earthquakes where there's you know, cars stuck in giant potholes in the middle of the road. Um, another feature, any buried tanks and infrastructure, can, pipes can become buoyant um, and float on the liquefied material and sort of lift up again, causing considerable damage to that infrastructure. So foundations, so it's not just buildings, it's, it's power lines and power poles and infrastructure can, can fail where it liquefies. Buildings can sort of settle, they can settle differentially. So one side settles more than the other, cracking the floor slab sort of thing. Um, they can tilt and just be off level. On the, on the left-hand side, it's, uh, what we're representing there is where you've got the, the, the saturated, unconsolidated material, but it's not constrained on, on, on one side. And, and typically this might be at a river bank or an estuary margin. And so the, the material can, as it liquefies, can move sideways or laterally um, into, the, into that river or closing the river channel a bit, um, but also causing sort of settlement and large tension cracks. So again, any structures or infrastructure on those areas can often, will fail. So this was all part of a, a national initiative um, following the MB and MFE guidance, the 2017 guidance. And so all councils have been required to, to undertake um, seismic liquefaction hazard mapping. So the guidance um, describes four levels of, of mapping, levels A through to D. And so we've done, I guess, the highest level, I'm going to say highest, but the, 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 the broader uh, mapping at level A, which is just a qualitative desktop study, um, primarily based on published geological maps, the, the LIDAR DEM, and, and I guess the local knowledge of the, of the geologist undertaking this work for us. So it didn't include site-specific geotechnical investigations. That would be what's included in a level B setting. So we're certainly aware of those. Um, uh, there is some out there. Um, there's a lot more detail on, on the specifics of how Becca did this mapping for us uh, on the website and then in their report. We've also produced an interactive map so you can see where the mapped extents of these areas are. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get those online for the other ones yet. There's still, I guess, the PDF maps within the reports, but in the near future, we hope to have a, an interactive map showing those. But, but there's certainly one there for the, the liquefaction mapping at present. And so here's just an example of that, that mapped output. And so this is just showing the, the Waimea Plains, so the sort of Richmond, Waimea, Mapua area. So I've mapped it into sort of three categories. The, if we start at the bottom um, and go for the, the darker blue, so this is just the areas of sort of bedrock or steeper slopes where there's no um, unconsolidated material to liquefy. So they've been mapped as with very, very you know, low liquefaction vulnerability. The next category there is sort of that uh, teal color. So where liquefaction damage is unlikely. So these are sort of unconsolidated materials, but they're predominantly areas where we know it's gravels or um, low water tables, such that it's unlikely to liquefy. 
So that leaves us with this, this remaining tan color, the sort of yellowy tan color, where liquefaction damage is possible. Um, it's not to say that that entire area will liquefy, but should liquefaction occur, we would expect it to, to be amongst that. And so it's going to be those, I guess, high risk areas that we talked about before, that the estuary margins, um, but it can also be an old buried river channel that's filled up with silt, so you get pockets of silt which might liquefy. But we do know that most of the, the Waimea plains are, are quite gravelly. Um, some of the audience may be noticing that the lower Queen Street um, sub um, urban development there, sort of the Berry Lands subdivision area, is in this area that liquefaction is possible. And through that subdivision process, they assessed that ground and were able to determine it was sufficiently gravel not to present a liquefaction hazard. Um, and so that, that's, that's a good point in that for the last 10 plus years, 15 years or so, it's been council's practice for subdivisions to require certification of the building sites. And so that's having a geotech or geoprofessional that's confirming the sites are suitable for building. And so one of the factors that we've, um, that they consider is liquefaction. So uh, generally any recent subdivisions, the liquefaction issue should already have been addressed. If we just go to the next slide, so this is, I guess it's the same thing, just showing some outputs from the Motueka Plains and also the Tarkaka Plains. And so again, it's the, it's, the, it's the broad alluvial plains where liquefaction is considered possible, but we do know that th these plains are predominantly gravelly and so, Yes, there'll be pockets of liquefaction on there, but it's not going to be widespread liquefaction across these areas. And so the outcome, I guess the net, just to finish off the liquefaction, I guess the net outcome there is if you are in those yellow areas and you do want to undertake a building, um, you just need confirmation that the ground is suitable for the foundations that you're using. And so that would either need an engineer or, 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 or an engineering geologist to make that assessment. Um, if it was a recent subdivision, all that work's already been done. So the sort of places that we would anticipate needing a specific assessment would be, say, an older house that was demolished and getting rebuilt, or it was on a section that's been in existence for quite some time. Um, and so it never got assessed when it was originally subdivided. So I'll just hand over to da Diana now, and she's going to just outline some of the plan processes, and then we'll finish up with any other questions that are remaining. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so as it says on the slides, currently we're at this point where we've done the technical review and we just, we're understanding what the hazard is um, and socialising it out into the community. So we all have a common understanding around these geological natural hazards. So next step over the course of this year will be to look at options around how to manage these hazards. Um, as part of the, the broader environmental policy team across all our different plan topics. Uh, we're currently drafting what we call issues and options on the plan topics. Um, and either the end of this year or early next year, we'll be doing community engagement on this work. So at that point, that will be the opportunity to get your feedback um, around what you think in terms of uh, potential management of these hazards. And then following that, uh, we'll be moving into plan drafting, um, very much bearing in mind that we're currently going through this period of Resource Management Act reform, and the government is proposing three new pieces of legislation, um, which will very much, I suppose, determine it and direct in terms of what that draft plan timeframe will actually look like in the future. Uh, so I'd encourage you to go to our specific Tasman Environment Plan website. You can see the, the address there. Uh, it's got a lot of information around the different planning topics, the work that we've done to date, um, and also the timeframes going forward. And also on that website, uh, you can sign up. We have like quarterly newsletters, uh, so that will keep you up to date with the plan process. So now I'll hand over to Tim for final questions. Absolutely. Plenty to take in there, uh, but I hope uh, everyone who's attended today is... Uh, uh, feels a bit more enlightened. Uh, they've, uh, yeah, whether they've had a, a question answered or just something that's been uh, 
on their mind they want to uh, sort out. So yes, we do have uh, a couple of final questions there that have come through on the uh, on the Q and A box. Um, is tidal wave risk data? Oh, <laughs> the tidal wave disk not risk data. See, I'm doing it now. Uh, covered under some other plan, and if so, where can we find it? Um, we have had tsunami evacuation mapping undertaken, and that is available on the Civil Defence website. And so that's not so much for planning purposes. This is for, I guess, large tsunami. And, and, and certainly here, the, the, the site, when we're talking about large tsunami, we're also talking about very infrequent tsunami. And so the focus is, has been on protecting people rather than property. So I guess what we're saying is we're not going to stop you building a house near the coast because of the tsunami hazard but we will prepare evacuation maps and push that message if it's long and strong and get gone. So that's if you feel a very large or long prolonged earthquake and you're near the coast, self-evacuate. Um, more frequent tsunamis that are smaller, uh, uh, also in the area where coastal storms would have an impact. And so generally the planning constraints we have around developing on the coast will cover those frequent tsunami and so, so I guess the answer to the question is yes, they're available on the Civil Defence website, but we don't limit building because of tsunami um, or tsunami alone. Um, but we certainly look to protect life by in terms of evacuation. And, and we, we're talking events that might happen, you know, with a, uh, on a two thousand year occurrence, and also over a long period of time, you'd have an average of you know, maybe two or three thousand years. So. Most of the time, a building will serve its useful life with occupants. Um, but yeah, we just want to make sure that if an event does happen, people are ready to self-evacuate. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that, that I think most councils around New Zealand um, don't have specific planning controls around managing tsunami and taking education and advice role. Um, certainly in terms of broader uh, coastal hazards, uh, Glenn and I are project leads around our coastal management project. Um, so if you go to council's website, you can find a lot more information around uh, coastal erosion, coastal inundation and sea level rise. Um, and so last year we did community engagement around high level options for coastal management. And so I'd encourage you to yeah, have a look on our website. Absolutely. Uh... Another question come in. Uh, is there going to be an interactive map like Nelson's like Nelson Council where you can see specific risks by property address? That 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 is our intention um, to have a, a public facing hazard viewer like that. Um, we've got one for the coastal hazards, um, as Donna just referred to, where you can see, I guess, identified by a property. Um, so certainly the intention is, but Again, I don't want to commit to a particular time for that, but certainly we expect something in the next 12 months. It's in development and we're currently testing it internally. Um, and I guess yeah, this, this has a, these geotechnical and geological hazards will be the, the first ones that we'll get out there. Absolutely. Okay, well, I'll we'll just give people an, an, another minute or so to. Uh, formulate a question if they do still have one um yeah and obviously informing you is 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 the key uh the key aim but uh you know it's not it's not there to raise alarm bells uh about uh imminent dangers but it's, it's really just letting you know where we're heading just uh it's just reassuring that we are um very much taking the uh, these geological hazards uh seriously and uh making some plans around that going forward um Right, yeah. That there is um there is one question that's coming through. Just um as a as a result of the mapping, and forgive me, it has if, if it has sort of been open answered somewhere else. Um, does it mean that developers will now suddenly need to get a geotechnical assessment prior to building? Um, well, not any more so than happens now, and so um, current practice for for subdivision is confirmation of the suitability of building sites so that, that nothing will change there. Um, if it's just 
rather than a, a developer if it's just a landowner wishing to put a, a building on there um, the sort of areas that we've identified are the sort of places where you would expect some geotech input into the design of the building platform any retaining structures associated with that and then also the foundations of the building so yeah it, it just would require that uh, expert input rather than just um, yeah, building it straight off a of plan yeah fantastic uh well i think uh it appears most of the questions that that, that were keen to be asked have been asked um as, as mentioned if um if there is one that that, that, that does come to mind later on um get in touch with us at the environment.plan at tasman.govt.nz um but i think probably now uh we probably will uh call that time and um yeah look thank you so much for joining us uh, over your lunch break hope it's been a time well spent um as well as thanking you yourselves uh, i'd like to thank glenn stevens and dinah worthy uh for making themselves available um yeah it's been it's been great and uh i know in this day and age uh you have a pretty substantial choice of webinars to attend so i'm so glad that you uh you chose our one to, uh, to come along to. Uh, my name's Tim O'Connell. Um, thank you so much again, and um, have a great weekend. And look, we look forward to uh, to receiving your feedback once we uh, once we get onto the engagement side of things. Thank you very much, and uh, kakite. <laughs>